All right, ladies, welcome back to Women Break Free. I'm very, very excited um, for another semester. So what we're going to be doing this semester is going through some more um, lessons uh, that are specific to um, what's going, what we see in the word in regard to women and um, the, the power of women and the, uh, the, the destiny and the purpose that we have. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to um, bring you guys into great new places, great new um, um, uh, calls for your life and, and, and ways for you to hear God and, and break free into um, new things and break out of old things that old ways of thinking and old um, traditions and, and even patriarchy that may have been holding you back. I'm going to go ahead and share our little screen here and hopefully you guys can see it. Let me know. If for some reason you cannot move something. Here we go. Give me a little thumbs up if you can see those of you who are still showing something. There, uh, Kathy, look up from your art. Can you see? Okay, there we go. Y'all can see what I'm doing here. Um, so uh, Women Break Free is our, um, our title. And um, it's really women. Hey, women, all you women, break free. Um, and that's not necessarily on you as women, that's, that's on that we need to do it. And sometimes we need to address um, people or issues or Satan or, or the traditions around us and sometimes um, ourselves um, and tell ourselves to, to um, buck up or suck it up or, or, or throw it off or break out to come into the new things God has for us. Um, I want you guys to know above all things, first and foremost, you are loved. You are empowered by God to serve however the Holy Spirit leads you. But believe it or not, as simple and as godly as this sounds, it is not something that is taught to all believers. It is not something that is taught to all women that they are loved, that they are empowered by God, that they can be or become anything that God tells them to be, that they can break through the world, the earth, the traditions of humans, of man, mankind on this earth. I believe women are called to lead, to preach in every area, lead in, um, in churches, in the business world, in the workplace, in um, homes, in marriages, in parenting, in, um, in every kind of ministry and church um, uh, thing. I, I believe it's it's definitely in the scriptures. We'll, we've gone through a lot of it before, and we'll go, keep going through examples in the word um, that um, you sh we should all be doing the stuff, as they say in charismatic circles, um, preaching and teaching and evangelizing and, and, and asking God for miracles and healings and all the big uh, um, exciting things that um, that are a part of our, our relationship with God and with the with the gifts of Holy Spirit, and I believe you are valuable and you deserve to be supported in your calling. And whether you're a male or a female, old or young, um, we all need support. We need love. But specifically for you guys, for women, um, I I want you guys to know that I support you. We support you. The calling that God has for you, and and sometimes we don't even know exactly what our calling is. Um, we're finding it out, you know, continuing to find it out as we grow in the Lord. Um, but um, we support you in the call that you have. Um, many, um, there are a whole lot of people, a whole lot of ministries, a whole lot of teaching in the world that have been since, literally since the beginning of time, that do not consider women to be worthy of consideration for doing all of this stuff, doing the stuff. Um, there are a lot of things that hold us back as women. There's tradition and there's poor Bible translations that literally have held women back. We talked about uh, a lady um, this summer uh, whose name, Catherine Bushnell, who um, really changed um, a lot for women. Dr. Bushnell um, realized that translations that she was seeing in, as a missionary in China, that they would tr translate things differently based solely on the traditions of the local villages and the local areas because they didn't believe in that women had um, um, any kind of power or should be in any kind of power. So they would change the translation. She thought, I wonder if that's happening back in America too. That shouldn't be happening. We should translate it the way it should be. It's supposed to be translated into, into the language um, from the originals. And so she started looking at it and realized that it was and really became a, a powerful uh, person um, in, 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 
talking about these these changing translations. So those kind of things and just the traditions that humans have, um, abuse and trauma and fears, um, hold us back um, as women. Um, and not just not knowing, not knowing the truth. I mean, I told this story a hundred times. I mean, me learning things about my abilities and that God has given me as a woman has really only happened in the last, you know, seven or eight years. Um, and and it, the moment it did, I mean, there were light bulbs, boom, boom, it was like lightning and fireworks and a little bit. And it was just simply bad teaching. And as soon as I found out, boom, instant, literally instant change that happened in me. Um, and, um, and then it gives us a right then to lead and to preach and to, and to protect. They say only men can protect. No, of course not. If you're um, a mother or even a, a daughter or, or a sister, we all know how to protect or a friend, how to protect and, and, and as a woman and to serve and to teach and to prophesy and to use the gifts God's given us and, and, and do all those things in any way, in any place that God um, calls us. We are valuable. You are valuable. You deserve to be supported in the calling that you have. And in this Bible study, um, I hope you will just grab a hold of these truths, break free of anything that is holding you back. Let me know if I, there's specific things I can pray for you or anybody else here. And um, and uh, you know, email me, call me, whatever. But let let me know that, so that we can um, break you free because God wants those things to just crumble off of you and sometimes it's a little at a time and sometimes it's all at once um <clears throat> so uh what we're what i'm this lesson on specifically is a um a, a term a, a, a phrase a hebrew um word name called i'm going to mess up the pronunciation but it's ashet kael ashet kael um it, it means woman of valor um there's several places that Aishat Kael is um, uh, written in the word. Um, and we're gonna talk about um, a few specific places tonight. It's a really important and key um, name for uh, a woman of value, valor. It, this, this name, um, it, 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 it's something that seems very um, unattainable and yet um, it's not. It is exactly what God desires of us. In Genesis 1, we we'll go all the way back, it begins with this statement that talks that says that a, both the man and the woman, the male and the female, are created in the image of God. Not the man is created more in God's image than the woman, nothing like that. It says very clearly that the man and the woman are both created in the image of God, imago Dei. In fact, when both came to come together, they form a picture of who God is. They become one, and just like just like the Lord God is one. Um, the, the scriptures talk about we and they uh, uh, as the Lord, and, and it's the triune, the Trinity that is, uh, that is one. It's an interesting, mysterious concept, um, but, um, but the human beings are also pictured as becoming one. They are both made in God's image. That's a really important key understanding of who we are as women is to know that we are created just like the man, the, the first human, the man and the woman are created in the image of God. In Genesis 2, we're not going to go through every chapter in the Bible, I promise. When the woman is created, she's called Azer Konegdo. I've got teachings on these, and we'll probably do some more of them um, throughout this uh, this fall, but I did some of these this last summer, so feel free to look those up. But the word Azer is often trans mistranslated to mean like a helper or a helpmate or a companion to someone else, but really it's it's like a lifesaver. It means a protector and a rescuer. Um, that's what the woman was created to be, a, a, an equal um, protector. The position of the woman in the very first chapters of the Bible is very strong. She is a savior figure, a, a rescuer, because it says the first human was alone and God wanted to provide an Ezra Konegdo, a helper, a rescuer, a lifesaver. Um, to take care of this first human's loneliness, gave this first human a second human and created this woman. Um, this is in contrast to this very low image that um, uh, of the women um, that in, in, in when Genesis was written, the near um, the Middle Eastern countries, the religions that were there, um, when Genesis was written, written, their attitudes about women were terrible. Um, they were not about, about equality. They were not saying that women were created in the image of God. They were, they were lesser beings. They were just there for slavery and, and abuse. 
but in the Bible, we see this, this, this connectedness and that it's about being free, emancipation, strength that, that the woman has that is a complete connection with the man, with the human, <clears throat> the other human, two humans, two humans, one. The, the Bible shows us the idea of a strong woman. So when you look into the, to the Hebrew books, we see um, the book like the books of Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, they all have these ideas of a strong woman. So when you look at the book of Psalms, you think of it as a worshipful book, but the worship is, is very emotional. Um, the language is very emotional and, and the music is. Um, then we, and, which you think of as sort of a feminine type of a thing, um, which, you know, is a silly way of thinking of because men and women are both very emotional um, creatures, but, um, but you, uh, uh, you see a feminine um, characteristics of the Lord, of him as a mother hen and, and a, a, a mother bear and things like that, um, that takes care of its young. Um, Proverbs talks about um, a life of wisdom, and the wisdom is described as a woman. Um, and in the Hebrew word for wisdom is this feminine noun. It actually means lady wisdom. And the reader is supposed to or encouraged to um, uh, know that this good life, the secret to a good life is to follow lady wisdom. So there's, there's this strength that comes um, from knowing this lady wisdom, and it's connected to um, to a woman, um, uh, womanness. Then the book of Proverbs, it comes to this big climax at the end that we think of as a big climax in Proverbs 31. Um, but for a whole lot of women, <laughs> Proverbs 31 is where we have a whole lot of problems. I know that it is not a, a chapter that I um, have in, in the past enjoyed reading. Um, it felt like a, a chapter that, um, especially the, the, the let, latter part, the first couple of verses are are um, just some of the same stuff from that King Lemuel guy, um, but then you get into the latter part, um, uh, the very end, and it and it can be a little overwhelming if it hasn't been taught to to us correctly. And we're going to go through some of it. The English um, translates the woman that's listed in Proverbs thirty one, starting in verse ten, as a lot of it times it's translated as a virtuous wife, um, or a capable wife or a virtuous and capable wife, or a wife of noble character. Um, who can find a wife of noble character? And these are all the characteristics. If you wanna grab your Bibles and look up Proverbs 31, um, starting in verse 10, you'll see um, uh, this uh, the listing of it. In fact, I was a little disappointed because my, uh, my favorite translation, the Common English Bible, actually says a, a virtuous uh, wife and not a woman is the way it should be. But um, a lot of them say a virtuous wife. But it actually is this Hebrew phrase, Eshet Kael. And Eshet Kael is not supposed to be translated as a virtuous wife. It is actually, literally, it means a physically, emotionally, spiritually, militarily, and mentally strong woman. <laughs> it's not just eh, a nice virtuous wife. It's a woman. Um, the, the word is Isha or Isha that, 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 um, in the Hebrew. That's, uh, we see that back in Genesis or related to Eve. It does not refer to a wife. It means a woman. It is not just a, a description in Proverbs of the characteristics of a wife. It is what a woman is supposed to be. Proverbs 31 describes a phenomenally strong woman, physically strong and, and can be emotionally strong, and it can be spiritually strong, and even militarily. When I think of that, of course, I'm not, I don't have a military, so to speak, around me, um, but uh, I, uh, or an army of any sort, I have a lot of kids, but, uh, but uh, there can be a little bit of an army if I do it right, but I think, when I think about military for myself, I think of just a st strategic person, someone who looks at a situation and comes up with a strategy to, um, to bring about victory, or to deal with the situation and attack, um, how to, uh, to gear up our forces, you know, all kinds of things, how to, how to encourage the troops, all of those kinds of things are part of a military mind. And those are something that definitely a woman um, is fully capable of. And that is the description that is really happening in Proverbs 31 is about a strong um, Aishit Kael woman. In the Hebrew Bible, the, the books that follow after Proverbs, now this is in the Hebrew, the way they do the order of their books of the Bible, a little bit different than the way we are, do our Old Testament, but the books that follow the Proverbs 31 
are examples of an Aishat Kael strong woman. Um, you see um, they have Job and the Song of Songs and Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther's are all books that have these either uh, identifiers or some sort of like bigger story like the Esther and Ruth, something in them that talks specifically to about these, these strong women, not necessarily strong wives, just women who are strong, virtuous, powerful in all different ways that you can be powerful <laughs> to the depths of your womanhood. <laughs> the main purpose of the book of Ruth is to focus on Ruth as an Eshet Kael, a prime example of the uh, woman of Proverbs 31. Ruth is called an Eshet Kael several times in the book. The book of Ruth is the story of the transformation of a woman who was very likely sexually abused and treated as human trafficking. She was a Moabite, as we know, and when her family went there, they married the two sons of, of this Hebrew family married a Moabite, and I don't think it was probably a it was very likely just something that they just took them. It wasn't probably like two families. They were like, oh yeah, you seem like a nice guy. Cause it looks like her, the, their hus the husbands of these, of these two, Ruth and her sister-in-law were not great guys. Um, and uh, they died soon after. And, and so um, it was a very strange situation. And it, it's quite possible that they were not um, brought into this family initially um, voluntarily which is abuse and sex and human trafficking as we know it today. Um, and yet here's this woman who ended up start, who started off this, this life um, uh, that we know about um, in a pretty horrific way, most likely, and, and ends up be, being called an Ashit Kael, a, um, a strong, powerful woman um, af, of God. The New Testament has many examples um, if we're going to the next, the next places that we hear, see about strong women, um, that are many examples regarding the restoration of women to a place of honor, just like Ruth was taken from a place of obscurity and, and, and difficult, horrible situation and brought into a place of honor and through her own inner strength um, and her connection to the Lord. We have stories of women um, in the book of Matthew, like Tamar and Rahab and Ruth and Bathsheba and Mary who um, four out of the five of those um, were abused in some way, were trafficked by men or, um, who were in positions of power and authority. And yet they are listed in the opening chapter of Matthew to, to say, these are the women who are in the genealogy of Jesus. They are highlighted along with a whole list of, of men. Um, and these are not the women that you would have thought. You would have thought it would say, you know, the Sarah or the Rebecca or the, 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 I don't know, some, some other woman that, you know, or even the Deborah or uh, that uh, was considered a, a um, good, righteous, upstanding woman. In, um, and yet these are the women that uh, are listed. Um, and in spite of this horrible life faced by all these women, the Bible elevates them to this high status. They become the bearers of the seed of the Messiah. Um, uh, eventually the Messiah comes from them, and yet they were in these horrible situations. The whole Bible is one big long narrative um, of the transformation of women and the stat their status in society. So Genesis begins with this very strong place for the woman. She's no ordinary helper for the man. She is divinely placed. She's a savior figure, the Azer Konegdo, which means a necessary ally. We talked about that a lot um, last summer. And the Lord does not intend for what they, what the Lord, what they, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, created to become second by the time we get to this description of Proverbs. The Lord didn't create the woman and then go, well, but, you know, right here in about Exodus. And then when we get to, you know, some of these judges and stuff, the women are down here, but that's okay with me. That's not what the Lord wanted. The Lord wanted complete equality the whole time. We just have chapter three of Genesis that kind of messes that up. Um, we're going to talk about that probably next week. A whole lot about the curse, um, curses that were given to the man and the woman and the serpent. Um, but uh, that's not what God intended for the woman and for the man um, to become what they did become by the time we get to thousand years later in the book of Proverbs in the, in the chapter 31. It wasn't about, oh, now um, the ultimate um, womanhood is to be um, a wife and to do all of these chores <laughs> that a wife is listed as doing in Proverbs 31. That's, that's not 
we're not supposed to connect those two things as being the beginning and then the end of what it means to be a real woman. Um, for our creation, from our creation identity, we uh, um, uh, uh, protectors, we are rescuers, uh, women are partners um, to our being Eshet Kael. I am having the hardest time saying that, you guys. I'm sorry. Eshet Kael. From the creation until um, till Eshet Kael, um, we are emotionally, physically, spiritually, and mentally strong women. Women are a part of the sal of salvation for humanity. We were a part of the beginning. We are um, we are part of the wisdom that um, it is expressed in Proverbs. We're the ultimate um, uh, uh, example of what wisdom and and being uh, next to uh, God and our and godliness is um, is a woman who who um, has these uh, a virtue to her, a valor to her, a power to her, and um, that's what we're supposed to see in Proverbs. But and yet we have a whole lot of other stuff thrown at us. God desires to use us to connect with his plans. We are supposed to be interceders, intercession, intercessors, intercessors <laughs> um, for, for humanity and serve humanity and rescue humanity and love humanity. That is our call and protect humanity. That's what we were created. That's what women were created to do. That's what you were created to do. And um, that's what uh, an Ashit Kael is supposed to do. There is a phrase that has been used quite a bit in the last few decades. Um, that expresses the place many expect women to be in. And that is a phrase, a, uh, a word called biblical womanhood. It, it's a very common term these days. There's a bunch of churches who like to use it um, in particular. It's something I talk about a lot because um, I think it is a it is a lie that is hurting women and families. And I will always bring, probably come up to with it. Um, for those who are new, um, uh, uh, say a lot about it because I do enjoy um, understanding history. And I think that it's important to know truth because I think not only does it help us individually, but it helps us to help other women. And this phrase biblical womanhood is, is pretty important because it sounds like a pretty simple thing, right? Kind of inno innocuous. Uh, uh, some words that are put together that should be something we Christian women should be reaching for. We should be biblical women. We should be women who who were following the Bible. That seems like no big deal, right? Um, but the trouble is that those words have been used not to free women, but to, um, in their relationship with God, but actually, actually using it to capture women, to capture us this biblical womanhood, it is a myth um, that a true woman is defined by her roles as a wife, a mother, and a homemaker. That is this phrase, biblical womanhood, the people and the people who, who push it, which I'm going to talk about in a second, um, that is what they believe it that that you're that is about your role, a biblical man hood and biblical womanhood is about the roles that they are supposed to be in. And those roles involve certain job descriptions. And for women, it is to become a wife, a mother, and a homemaker. Um, and um, that can be difficult if you're not married, <laughs> if you don't have kids, or you're really good at working out of the home. <laughs> that, then you just, then you're in a mess, right? Um, but that is uh, what is considered um, the ultimate. Um, there is a book, uh, a little side note, a little side box, a book I recommend called A Year of Biblical Womanhood. It was written um, about a decade or so ago um, by a lady named Rachel Held Evans. She has um, passed away a few years ago unexpectedly, um, and it was quite sad because she was pretty young, but um, she wrote this book, and it was kind of a start of, of a movement to begin to address this, these, this idea of this biblical womanhood. Now, I just as a, a little side note here, I um, will often recommend books and, and podcasts and um, videos and and movies and things like that and um in the with the books especially or blogs i do not necessarily um um hold to every single thing that every one of these people believe some of the women and men uh, may be a little more progressive or liberal in some of their ideas than me some of them may be more conservative in their theologies and their ideas than me but um, overall, if I'm recommending them, I think that they would be beneficial for you to just expand your knowledge, expand your understanding of, of whatever it is that we're talking about. Um, so as with anything, you know, read it and the more you read and the more you take in, you'll be able to kind of dissect it and, and, and tweak your own theology and your understanding that God is giving you, um, understanding. So Rachel Held Evans, um, is, a uh, 
considered a little uh, progressive by some. Uh, they, they, she freaks them out. Um, for uh, for others, it's great. Uh, I really liked this particular book. <laughs> it was uh, kind of funny because she actually took a year and she tried to do everything that the Bible said you're supposed to do. <laughs> so she like would um, like she went to the the gates of her city and stood there and called out praises of her husband <laughs> um, out loud because that's what the Bible says to do that you're supposed to praise your husband in the city gates. So she did very specific things and she did it for a reason to um, to help people to understand what um, what these uh, things mean for women and in general. But it's a really interesting book. But these ideas um, are are kind of encapsulated in that book and a whole bunch of other books that I'll recommend. But the, what, what happens with this concept of biblical womanhood is that um, defining a woman or um, femininity being, a, being feminine by our behavior, especially at, as it is in relation to a man or to um, children, whether it's our own children or children we're supposed to be, you know, the children's director of or something, is not what God wants for us. That's not our only roles, our only jobs in life is to be somehow in connection with husbands or men and children and be in some form of submission to them or or taking care of them. The creation of a woman to stand with man or with a human of any kind is about a partnership. Two humans who would be able to help one another fulfill God's plans on the earth. There's this one passage in particular that is used very often poorly to put unreal expectations on women. And like I said before, it is Proverbs 31. We see Proverbs 31 everywhere in American evangelical culture. We got it on pillows. We got it on paintings. We got it on, and I, as I was Googling around looking for a few things, I saw bracelets and necklaces and and um, bumper stickers of course and anything else you can imagine that we could put a phrase on or put a scripture on we're going to put proverbs 31 on something to make us um, remember that this is the highest goal <laughs> that women can achieve is to become a proverbs 31 woman which is, in and of itself that passage i'm quite sure was not what um the Lord or um, King Solomon had in mind <laughs> when he wrote, if, if he was the one, whoever it was that wrote uh, that passage. Um, it's, uh, the passage is associated with all the ultimate and feminism and femininity. The culmination of it is, is cross-stitch, the cross-stitch verse on everything, the most cross-stitch verse of all time. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. I don't mean to make fun. I think that's a very great verse and, and something that uh, we should all be striving for. But um, seeing it on cross-stitched on and painted and 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 embossed and, on, and everything else on everything you can imagine um, takes a little of the uh, truth out of it. Um, so it's something that, that we need to be careful of, you know, just throwing it on a, a, a cross stitch on our wall does not mean that we really truly get it, right? Um, <clears throat> so far too many times when this chapter of Proverbs 31 is taught or even thrown at a woman, it reduces womanhood, as Rachel Held Evans said in her, in, uh, in her blog, it reduces womanhood to marriage motherhood and domesticity when really this passage is about character that transcend, transcends gender or circumstance it's not about what you're doing and your job and your role it's it's about who you are and your character so we're going to talk say talk three things that you might not know about proverbs 31 and the ashet kael woman Number one, it is a poem. Proverbs 31 is a poem. Why does that make a difference? It makes a huge difference. It's not just a list of, of things that we're supposed to be doing. It is a poem, which means it has, it has symbolism and it has a deeper meaning. I'm not very good with poetry. If I was, I would probably be able to use better words to describe it, but it's about, there's a depth to it uh, uh, that, that we have to look, we have to look at it in, in a different way than just this some kind of special list. Hey, Judy. What's up, girl? I saw uh, Paula joined us as well. Um, so this 22-line poem is called The Woman of Noble Character, um, and because kind of as close of a, uh, or, or a virtuous woman um, we kind of get, or a, a woman of valor, all of those are our kind of poor English translation. Um, and it is meant to be a tangible expression of the entire book, all of Proverbs, this theme of wisdom. If you talk, if someone says, what's Proverbs about? We all have been in the 
church long enough, Christians, we all know we would say it's about wisdom, right? Well, here's the big culmination, big poem that, you know, when you're a preacher, you always have three points in a poem, right? That's what the good Baptist preachers always do, three points in a poem. Well, uh, Samuel had, you know, three chapter, I mean, Samuel, uh, not Samuel, um, Solomon, and all the other guys who, and, and women, actually, they think that um, that some of it was written by possibly um, Solomon's mother, which is Bathsheba, or some other women, um, but they don't get quite the credit, but there's some changes all throughout the, the book. Um, but um, the big culmination to all of his points is this big poem at the end um, about wisdom. Some people call it a song, but we're gonna call it a poem. The author is essentially showing us that wisdom, what it looks like in action. The reader is supposed to make this connection between the Proverbs 31 woman that we call it and woman wisdom, which is talked about earlier in some of the chapters before that. And we're supposed to connect them and say, oh, this is what this person looks like and what they're doing. Um, as you, if you remember a lot of, a lot of the book of uh, uh, song uh, Proverbs and even Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, all those things, they're all, you know, these little phrases, one or two lines that tell us if you do this, this happens, don't do this, or this happens. And this is um, the big culmination chapter of it. So this poem is an acrostic. So the word, um, first word of each verse begins with a letter from the Hebrew alphabet. I did not like go in and check that for sure, but, <laughs> but that's what my research showed because you know, I'm doing the hard work for you guys, doing the Lord's work, the things you don't wanna do, I, but I did not <laughs> specifically look up all the Hebrew alphabet, but that's what I did read. It is an acrostic, one of those special poems. Like when you write mother, mother means may I have a cookie? I don't know, whatever. <laughs> oh, means whatever. <laughs> but uh, that's what it is. Proverbs 31 should be interpreted prescriptively. It is, um, sh sorry, should not be interpreted prescriptively. It's not a job description for all women. It is, um, it is describing what wisdom looks like, but it is not saying that you have to do all these things in this poem. Its purpose is to celebrate wisdom in action not to instruct women everywhere to get married, have children, and take up the loom. Thank goodness I do not need another hobby. Too many, right, Kathy? The target audience of Proverbs 31 is actually men, believe it or not. Um, it is actually a song that many in the uh, traditions of the, um, uh, the Jewish traditions, a lot of times on, um, I believe it's uh, on Shabbat, they will, uh, men might sing this over the women in their home or the their wife, um, uh, but it, it is not a target, um, the target audience is not women, hey, here's the list to make you the right kind of woman. The only instructions that are given in the whole poem are actually directed to men, and it says, praise her, for all her hands have done. I'm looking for that. I love it when my men in my life give me that praise. I get that a lot. That's good. I got a good one in my, in my house. And yet many Christians interpret this passage prescriptively. Now, if you've been following my, my little lessons, we know that there's a difference between prescriptive language and descriptive language, describing what something is supposed, what is supposed to happen or prescribing it. There's a little bit of a difference um, and a lot of a difference. And ma many Christians interpret this prescriptively as a command to women rather than an ode to women with the homemaker like task of the Proverbs 31 woman portrayed as an ideal lifestyle for all women. And they're saying, this is what you're, this is what God wants of all women. And man, I'm telling you, it messed me up, messed me up big time. Um, for many, many years, uh, thinking that I had, to, in fact, like I said, I just didn't even read it. I was like, I'm not even reading that. I'll just skip over to like uh, JL. I like that passage. I'm going to read about Abigail and, you know, and somebody who did something wild and crazy. That's more up my style. Um, uh, the target audience is, is men. And yet we have a, an empire of books and conferences and products and media teaching women how they should behave as a true Proverbs 31 woman. You guys may have seen some of these books. I just I was Googling around. Um, there's, there's whole um, uh, websites and um, Facebook pages and groups and, and, and all kinds of things um, uh, that um, tell us how to, how to clean your house. Um, uh, 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 the, at the bottom, it says a virtuous the one over on the far right. 
um, uh, is the little manual there. Um, the uh, <laughs> Some of these titles are crazy. Bible studies and books and, and all kinds of cool things. The six characteristics of a wise woman a Proverbs 31 homemaker. I mean, I mean, th some of these, I mean, I think y'all all had to turn off your screens because I think all y'all are about to throw up, right? But <laughs> I know it's, it's hard. It's intense. It's hard being a woman, you guys. This chapter um, that lists all these things over here, it, it talks about she was up before the dawn. She had her own garden. She made clothes for herself. She owned and ran her own business. This Proverbs 31 woman was fantastic. She, she, her children adored her. Um, she, her husband praised her. She was in temple fight. So you got to have a husband or you're not doing it right. You got to have kids or you're not doing it right. Um, took care of everybody's needs, um, whether they're in the house or out of the house. She had all this wisdom. And of course, after doing a whole list, she also feared the Lord. That's good too. But she had to do all those other things and be, to be declared that perfect Proverbs 31 woman. Um, this chapter has evolved from the poem's intended audience, men, um, to that of women, and it's used to hit us over the head with shame that we're not able to check off the list of tasks expected of us. The shame and anxiety that is on women <laughs> is pretty is pretty tough. Now, side note for those of you who are new, I am not anti-men. <laughs> I am definitely not. I have a wonderful husband. I have a wonderful son, a wonderful son-in-law. I know wonderful men, best close friends, wonderful pastors and people around me. I also, I know sucking men and I know sucking women too. There's a whole bunch of people out there that are good and bad. I do not have anything against men. I am, however, teaching a, whim, a women's Bible study about women. <laughs> so I am going to be telling stories that do kind of make it sound that way. I don't want you guys to think that though. Um, but, uh, but there are some things that, you know, there's a patriarchy out there and there's a, there's a whole lot of things that have been done in the name of God um, to hurt women that are still being done. And, um, and, this, and women can do it to us too, hitting us over the head um, uh, and shaming us for not fulfilling the Proverbs 31 woman list. Um, that is, but we just have to keep knowing, not only for our own selves, but to help other people know that that is not what God intended. The, another characteristic of the three that I mentioned um, uh, uh, that uh, is an interesting note about Proverbs 31 is it's actually celebrating valor. What is valor, you say? I will tell you. The first line of the Proverbs 31 poem, a virtuous woman is the way it's sometimes translated, who can find, is really should be a woman of valor who can find. We're on the hunt for a valor, woman of valor. The, the Hebrew is Eshet Kael, woman of valor. The male equivalent to that would be Gibor Kael, a man of valor. Um, so there is, you know, there, it, it, it's a common phrase in Hebrew. Valor isn't about what you do, though. It's about how you do it. Valor means um, uh, basically a strength of mind or spirit that enables a person to encounter danger with firmness, with toughness, with courage, with bravery. Um, you, we give a medal of valor um, in, in, um, in the armed services and it is about something that is done. It's not just like sitting in the corner to being really good at playing video games or, um, you know, talking on the phone. It's, <laughs> or texting, I guess we don't talk. Um, but it is a strength and inner strength that you can see in an action. There has to be courage. You, Courage can be on the inside, but usually at some point it has to come out. There is a bravery that is done, and that is what a woman of valor is. And then, of course, that list that we see are all the valorous, um, virtuous things that a woman um, is doing that are being honored. But see, the problem is for many Christians, this idea that I mentioned earlier, this biblical womanhood is the standard um, that women are supposed to strive for, not valor not courage and bravery, but a different idea. Um, in 1987, this group of men got together to write something called the Danvers Statement. It was in reaction to the rise of feminism, what's called the second wave feminism. I don't think I have that in my notes here, but second wave, first wave feminism in America was when we got to vote, the suffrage movement back in the 20s, um, which if you ever, study that in history, what the women had to do, the courage they had to have um, to, to stand up for their own just right to vote was, was unbelievable. Um, and um, then um, in the um, 70s, uh, we began to see 
a rise in this, what's called second wave feminism. Women began to realize, oh, I can work out of the home. I can even things like being able to um, take care of their own, um, you know, the birth control pill, which I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying that it gave women the power to say, no, I don't want to have children anymore. And, and, and whether that was right or wrong, it simply, it changed our understanding of what women, what we as women had the power to do. We had our own agency. We had the ability to say yes or no. It wasn't just, you are stuck in this place. And the church began to change. Women began to have more opportunities to preach and to teach and inequality was coming to, um, to churches and to denominations. And um, a group of men didn't like that. <laughs> and some of them, many of whom have become very famous now, um, wrote uh, the, something called the Danvers Statement. Um, I think they were in Danvers, uh, Maryland. So anyway, that's why they call it that. I um, mean, you can read it online. It's interesting. It's, it's very short. It's just a little statement. And, so, and then a few years later, in 1991, a couple of them got together, John Piper and Wayne Grudem, and they put a, together a collection of articles intended to combat this rise of feminism and establish the theology of what God desires for men and women and how they relate to one another, the roles that they are supposed to be in. And they wrote this book, and it's called Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. Look at those big giant capital letters. Manhood and Womanhood, a response to evangelical feminism. All of this happened because they didn't like that men and women were becoming equal, basically, is what it was. Women had a voice, and women were being able, were, were beginning to um, um, uh, be in roles that they did not like and they did not think were scriptural. They, they were going by the scriptures, mostly, um, although later on they did change a few, um, and that's in one of my other lessons, but um, this book, which I do not recommend <laughs> reading unless you really want to get mad or messed up, um, but uh, Recovering Biblical Man and Womanhood is an interesting set of essays, but it really changed, it really changed America for sure, um, and in it they teach gender roles and that a kind patri patriarchy, a loving patriarchy, we are, we men are um, your leaders, but we'll be loving and kind about it. And it really is God's plan for men and women. And if you'll just do what we say, then you'll be fine. Um, <clears throat> and as it began, the biblical manhood and womanhood movement in the uh, 90s and into the 2000s was concerned about the quote, this is from their, their uh, papers. They were concerned about the increasing promotion given to feminist egalitarianism or equality, mutual mutuality and quote, the widespread ambivalence regarding the values of motherhood, vocational homemaking, and the many ministries historically performed by women. So women, being a woman, became about, continues to be about, because a lot of churches, Calvinist reform churches, and a lot of others um, um, uh, pushed this, uh, continued push this biblical manhood and womanhood ideas. Um, they have whole Bibles dedicated to it, very famous Bibles. Um, so uh, according to the statement, there are distinctions in masculine and feminine roles that are ordained by God as part of the created order. As you can figure out, I don't believe that. <laughs> um, and and uh, I, uh, I can, I've I been doing a lot of teaching and reading and all that other stuff on all that. And, and, and I'll keep doing that throughout this, this next several lessons. And I've been doing it all year. Um, but uh, um, the, the distinction of roles, it is not denying that men and women are different, that there are differences in, in our strengths and our weaknesses, but it's just saying that just telling someone that they are stuck in a particular job and that they are under men simply because they are men, because they have men parts, um, uh, is what God desires. And yet throughout scripture, you see that is not the way God, uh, uh, makes makes us he, he's not, not what he desires for us there are plenty of examples of women doing things outside of the norm um for instance deborah and abigail and mary and mary and mary and um priscilla and aquila and anna and hulda and jl and eve and and uh and a whole bunch of others um so and jacobed and zipporah and some really cool other ladies um this movement uh, is called complementarianism. Um, egalitarian is what I am. Um, complementarian is uh, the idea that men and women are in very specific roles that they have to fulfill. And complementarianism is a re religious reaction to second wave feminism, as I said. Um, it 
it is preoccupied with recapturing an idealized vision of pre feminism feminist 1950s America that relegates a woman's identity to her roles as mother and wife and homemaker. So it's June Cleaver. For those of us who are a little bit older <laughs> from the TV show, Leave it to Beaver. I know some of you guys are a little younger and you're going, what in the world is she talking about? But back in the blah, 50s, 60s, there was a TV show called Leave it to Beaver. Beaver was the little kid in the show and he was always getting himself in trouble. But he would come home and mom would have his sandwich and she would have the house cleaned. The house was always perfect. And his friends would talk him into doing stupid things. But then his mom and his dad would would um, would help him out and, and forgive him and all this stuff. And so it was just this perfect little mother at home. Nothing wrong with a mom at home. Believe me, I, I've done that role. Not as good as her. But um, but uh, um, it's it's the idea that is being pushed by many is this 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 claim that this is actually what biblical womanhood is, is this 1950s June Cleaver, um, always hair, always done, greet your husband at the door with a martini or a milk or whatever it is he likes and um and taking care of all his needs and the kids needs and never causing anybody any problems um but the truth is that true biblical womanhood is return to the a patriarchal culture that from when the bible is written if you want to be a biblical woman um does that mean you know this is a time when fathers own their daughters and sold them to the highest bidder or when multiple wives and concub concubines are a part of your everyday life or when women were forbidden from owning property or when foreign virgins could be captured as spoils of war, when a woman's lack of virginity could get her executed. These are all things that are in our Bible. And um, that's biblical, is it? Is it what Abraham was doing? Is it what Dave was doing? Of course, anybody who wrote the recovering book that I mentioned, or that you asked today, they're in some of these churches that preach this, they would say, of course, that's not what they mean. Um, but rather than admitting that they don't actually want a return to that kind of biblical womanhood or patriarchy, these complementarians say, um, well, we want this June Cleaver kind of shaped mold, um, and um, which that'd be kind of a funny June Cleaver jello mold. Anyway, but they, they want that uh, kind of a thing instead. And, and, and so it's like, well, you're just you just want something that puts you in charge is what you're saying uh so complementary teaching we see an emphasis on biblical passages that mostly are there to celebrate marriage and motherhood and domesticity and they neglect the passages that celebrate singleness women who are single women who do amazing um uh powerful uh things um uh women whose lives looked nothing like the nuclear family that we see in the leave it to beaver shows um, and um, they are, um, they, they only want us to focus on the mothers and the wives passages. And then even those are twisted to only um, when it talks about a passage that says wives submit to your husbands, they seem to somehow skip the passage right before that says husbands submit to your wives. So, so those kind of teachings have in, inundated us and um, make it our marriages difficult, make our, our, our child rearing difficult, make us make it difficult for us to go into ministries or evangelism or um, church leadership or just partnering with a, another human, a man, um, um, and saying, hey, let's go do this job that God has given us, um, uh, starting businesses together or whatever, because there has to be some kind of weird order based solely on, you know, body parts, men parts. Um, women working for their husbands and their kids is considered the ideal. Women working outside the home is considered ungodly, even sinful. I mean, wave your hand around if you've ever heard anything like that <laughs> um, because, uh, or or maybe been told that. Um, I have felt that, I believe that, I was taught that in, in some ways um, by my family, some of it spoken, some of it sort of implied um, and, and through churches and it messed me up. It messed up my ability to make decisions for my kids and for my husband, the mistake, and I'm not one who has a problem usually making decisions. So imagine how held back I was, you guys. That's that's kind of crazy for me. The mistake these complementarians make is not in saying that a woman honors God by serving in the home. There's nothing wrong with that, you guys. The mistake they make is in saying that the only way a woman honors God is by serving in the home. A Christian woman's highest calling is not motherhood. A Christian woman's highest calling is to follow Christ.
the Bible doesn't give us June Cleaver. God bless June Cleaver. And it does, I did actually like that show a lot. I don't have a problem with that show. And it doesn't give us carbon copies of the Proverbs 31 woman either. Deborah and Ruth, Bashti and Tamar. Think about these women and the craziness that they were living in. Deborah, Ruth, Bashti. How many sermons or th thoughts have you had about Vashti, how she messed up because she disobeyed the king? Really? She was being trafficked and, or not trafficked, but abused and, and told <laughs> some pretty crazy uh, circumstances. Um, and she said no. Tamar, Abigail, Jochebed, these are big names in, in the Bible that some, you know, that they had to stand up for, for things or had to, to, uh, manipulate certain situations to get um, what they needed um, uh, to just live in some cases. Mary Magdalene, uh, Mary of Bethany, Junia, Priscilla, and a host of other women that can never be crammed into the the June Cleaver Jello mold. Um, <laughs> so Ruth, Ruth is an amazing story, and I'm actually going to do a bigger in-depth study of Ruth. I'm learning more and more about her all through the summer. I just keep kind of running into stories and things that I'd never really known. It's a short little book, yet it is completely packed full. Our church actually did a an amazing little um, a little musical um, about uh, the, the story of Ruth that I was very anxious about when I went to go see it because I thought, oh, this is a tough story. Are they going to, what are they going to do with her? Are they going to over-sexualize it? Are they going to, and they did an amazing job. The writer um, of uh, was fantastic. If you can find it, on, I'll, I'll see if I can find the video of it or a replay of it or something because it was really really well done it was a really fun musical but um but the 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 strength of the women all of the women throughout the this little musical that I'm talking about the 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 writer who was a guy named Justin Reyna um and others but I think he was the lead writer what he did in showing the power of the women in the story the Ruth and the Naomi character and then they brought in some other characters the strength of these women was amazing as they went through this musical so Ruth is actually one of the key figures you would think of when you if you said this Ashit Kael she is called a woman of valor the exact same phrase used to describe the woman in Proverbs 31 yet seems to be the exact opposite of a Proverbs 31 woman the way we think of her she was a Moabite um, uh, Hebrew men were actually forbidden from, to, from marrying foreign wives. She didn't have any children. After eight years of marriage, she had no child. She was single. She ended up being single because she was, became a widow. Um, a foreign widow would not have been considered a desirable wife for any Hebrew man. Um, uh, Ruth was dirt poor uh, and she didn't get to exchange fine linens like it says in Proverbs 31 to bring home for her children and her husband. She spent her days gleaning the leftovers of the workers in the fields and just so she and her mother-in-law could survive. This is not, this Ashit Kael woman was not what is described in Proverbs 31. In spite of looking nothing like June Cleaver or the ideal biblical woman, she's called Asher Kael, just like that Proverbs 31 woman. She is called a woman of valor before she marries Boaz. He calls her that when she was still poor, when she was still childless, when she was still a Moabite, a foreigner. That's when she was called an Asher Kael before she uh, had, uh, uh, was with child with, and married him, and before she became wealthy and influential, she was an Ashit Kyle. It is not about, um, not what you do that makes you a woman of value. It's how you do it that makes you a woman of valor. She was doing the things that she did with valor, with courage, with power, with strength, with bravery. She had strategies and, and, and listened to her, her mother-in-law and listened to the Lord. And, um, and, and, um, that was what made her an Ashit Kyle because of, um, the things that she did, her relationship with God and her relationship with a godly woman, Naomi. Ruth is not identified as a woman of valor, valor because she checked off the to-do list by keeping her cows clean and having kids and all that stuff. She lived her life with bravery, wisdom, and strength. We Christians should be honoring women who exhibit strong character, regardless of their various roles, their stations in life. If they are a woman of valor, tell them you're an Ashit Kyle, if you can say it, or just say, hey, woman of valor, I see what you're doing there. I got you. I got your back. I see you. Our roles in life are not static. They change. 
my role as a woman has definitely changed since the time I was a kid when I became a Christian and went through college, dated, had kids. I mean, I certainly did not know I was going to who I was going to marry. I certainly didn't know that I was going to end up with four kids. Um, I, and, and that changed. And then all of a sudden those, those kids were gone. And as I saw that those kids were gone, we're about to leave. I said, you know, I got to do some things. So I'm fixing to be a, an empty nester. So I changed some things in my life. I, I wanted to be ready. I, I changed my friendships. I started going to coffee with some new friends and, and getting to know people and do, doing things differently and offering Bible studies in my house because I was working differently. Things changed. My circumstances changed. Um, and, and my role in life was not static. It's not always, you know, being a wife. Um, I, I could have ended up being divorced or, or widowed um, or maybe never even gotten married. Um, um, and, 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 and then all of a sudden become married later on. There's so many different ways that women, um, become who we are throughout life. And it all changes our circumstances, changes, it shifts, time changes us. Women who are asked to ground their identity only as wives or mothers or homemakers. We don't have a solid ground because it changes all the time. Um, we can't just say, oh, I'm a wife forever. It, it may not happen that way. It's our character that defines us, not our roles. If the Bible teaches us anything about women, it's that women of valor can be found in all cultures, in all kinds of roles, in all kinds of circumstances. A Proverbs 31, woman of valor, it's only about character. A woman of noble character will fulfill any role with valor from the one down in the pits like Ruth, you know, gleaning dirt poor to the wealthy um, woman like an Esther who was a, a queen, but had to um, hear what God had to say um, to uh, fulfill her role um, with courage. The purpose of the ideal woman from Proverbs is not to discourage us, but rather to furnish us with a goal to become wise women. Our goal is to grow in the character qualities of the Ashik Kyle, her determination, her trustworthiness, her shrewdness, I love a shrewd woman, and her initiative, her diligence, her foresight, the prizing of her resources, not exactly what she did getting up early. Sometimes, hey, maybe we got a different kind of job. We don't get to get up early. Sometimes we're just tired. We need to sleep in. <laughs> um, sometimes we're retired. We don't have to get up early. We'll do it later. Um, we, we don't have to have that checked off all the time. And uh, and all the and working a loom and and making sure our husband is praised in the gates. We may not have a husband. Some of you guys are applauding that about yourselves earlier. Way to go! <laughs> a virtuous woman is the one who possesses these qualities. Um, oh, just so you know, you guys, I I don't actually read the chats as we're going because I don't have that page up. But every once in a while, I see him pop up there, and I'm like, oh crud! I need you. I need you to look at that. But so feel free to just pop in and say something if you need to. The virtuous woman is the one who possesses these qualities of valor. The virtuous human is the one who possesses these qualities. They're not just men, women qualities, right? Being courageous, getting up early, um, uh, uh, being someone who, who their spouse or their children praise them or their spouse praises them in the gates. Um, these are qualities that, that we should be teaching to young men and to young women. Like I said, this whole book was, you know, written for the people, for young men, for um, women. It was, it was about, um, learning about what a wise person is supposed to be, someone who is doing godly things. Um, we should teach everybody about these qualities. I get very frustrated whenever <laughs> so you see somebody's coming forward like, oh, they're going on a trip and they're going to, our church, you know, somebody's going to prophesy to them before they do this big, amazing thing. And they bring the person forward. And very often, it's not bad. I'm not saying they're wrong, but quite often <laughs> the prophecy will be, I see you, you are an Esther. <laughs> They never seem to say that to the young men. <laughs> um, they only say, say it to the women. We, we come up with women in the Bible, which what, Esther was a great one, but there's some amazing, courageous um, qualities of Esther that why don't we say that about some of the young men? Why don't we pray that over them? You know, just a little side note of, of, of stuff that I think about way too hard. Like Ruth, God-fearing women who embrace and live out the Lord's commands can change their nations and the course of history. Now, I'm going to tell you about some of my favorite recent discoveries of documentaries and things, um, because, uh, you know, why not? I got I, I can just take as much time as I want. Right. OK, Nichelle Nichols, if you ever watch Star Trek or even if you never watch Star Trek, this is a one. This is Lieutenant Uhura from the original Star Trek series. They did a documentary on her called Women, Woman in Motion. That is unbelievable. She literally changed the 
universe, you guys, the universe, because what she did for NASA, you will not believe it. It is crazy, but she has an amazing documentary and she has an amazing voice and she sings and she sings a song at the end that um, my husband and I got on our Spotify because it was so cool. Um, uh, but anyway, some, there's some cool Facebook pages like Woman you, Women You Should Know or A Mighty Girl that just every once in a while something pops up that some amazing story about a young woman or an older woman that um, or somebody from history that that did some crazy thing like in World War One, and you didn't know that they were a spy or the other day I read about a woman who was from Russia who was the the most prolific sniper in in um at that time period like in history and um and what happened with her um crazy amazing things and they they give you like encouragement like look at what these women have done and uh, a documentary that I'm about to watch I haven't watched yet but I've heard a lot about it called End of the Line it's a recent uh, story about the women women of Standing Rock what's happening right now with the pipeline some things that are that um uh we're coming through um, like the Dakotas, I think, and their reservation and what they are trying to do. And it's about these women who are standing up, whether you agree with it politically or not. <laughs> um, it is an amazing story about women and what they are doing and how their power, their courage is trying to transform this um, very horrible, um, difficult political situation for them. And then, of course, Katherine Johnson. I mean, you got to always talk about the mathematician, the physicist, Katherine Johnson, who, of course, we have the movie Hidden Figures that probably does not do her justice and what she had to go through um, to become the most important NASA um, mathematician that we had um, during the, uh, the, the, the rocket uh, getting us to the moon and, and all that kind of stuff. There's just just a tiny like couple of little stories that I just love to hear about these women in history who have literally changed history um, because of their courage, their valor, their, um, their, their knowledge, their academic um, prowess, all that stuff. Having this, the ideal woman though, thrown in our face, the biblical woman and what it's supposed to be, it can mess us up, you guys. For some, it can cause us to be super driven and it pushes us. Oh, I've got to do this and I've got to do that. And I, and I didn't get up early enough and I didn't, I didn't um, take care of my family the right way. And God's not going to like me and God's going to be mad at me. And, and I didn't, um, I'm not out buying land and, and I don't have my own business. There's a lot of reasons why women don't aren't doing their own business or aren't getting up early or aren't able to sometimes even take care of their husbands. Sometimes there's mental health issues. Sometimes there's circumstance issues. So there's just a million different things. And this checklist makes us crazy. And some people, they will, women, they will drive themselves into the ground trying to fulfill this list. And then for others, um, the list is so ominous. It's so impossible that to check off every box, you just say, nope, forget it. I'm going to go sit in the corner over here. I'm going to go hide. I'm not going to get married. I'm not going to have kids. Or, I, or even if I have them, I just can't do it. I'm not going to go help anybody in the church because somebody's going to judge me for not doing it well enough or, or, um, or just, just your own personal relationship with God where you just feel like you're not doing it right. That is not what God has for you. That is not what any of us want for you. You don't have to hide and you don't have to be driven. The, they both bring, make it, can make us feel shame. They can make us feel like we're sinful, believing that God is angry at us. I believe that a lot. I got to where I just like kind of hid away, didn't read certain passages in the Bible or just didn't read the Bible at all because I was afraid that God would be mad at me because if I didn't read it, that mean I meant I really wasn't responsible for it is what I felt like. Um, and, and that I wasn't, or that just feeling like I wasn't working hard enough to be a godly biblical woman. I do not want that for you guys. I do not want that. And that is like the main reason that I teach this series on women. Um, and it's not, a, it's not about men and, and there's a lot of things that men are having to go through as well. But for women, there's a level of shame that I understand just simply because I'm a girl um, that um, I don't want that for you guys or for the, or the, your children or, or grandchildren or anyone who's around you. Um, if you can make a list, this is what I'd like for you to do, you guys. You don't do it tonight. You don't have to show me. If you want to, you can. I love a nice email or text. But um, just make yourself a list and say, what are these, some of these ways that I have been led to believe that I am not truly a virtuous woman? I mean, if, you, if you're really brave, go through the list in, the, in Proverbs 31 and say, okay, have I done this? Have I been feeling guilty because I don't get up early enough or I haven't been running my own business or I haven't, or my kids are mad at me or hate me? Um, and, and, and say, what are these things on this list that are messing me up? And then make another list. 
first you might you know, like rip that one up and scratch through it or throw it away or something but go ahead and make the list be brave if you're if you are if you can and then but then make another list and even if you can't make the first list make this list one the the one that you really want to make list all the ways that you are an ancient coyote because i know you guys are it may be it may be uh, a little bit of courage it may be a lot of courage it may be that you've stood up against bullies. I know some of you, I know you've stood up to bullies. I know you've stood up to the enemy, to Satan, your intercessor, or sometimes you just get in somebody's face. Maybe you had to stand up against a father or a brother or an uncle or, or your husband, maybe, or your son. <laughs> um, maybe uh, you've had to get up in, in, in front of a, a meeting at your school, uh, at your kid's school, or, or maybe in, in business or, um, or uh, just maybe just even personally, the courage, the valor that it took sometimes even just to get out of bed, you guys, that's okay too. Your emotions, um, it's, it's tough. <laughs> and, and women, we've got, we've got some tough chemicals and hormones and everything that, that can give us a whole nother level of, of, uh, of crazy sometimes and um, difficulty. List those ways though. I have this thing in my family. <laughs> we are allowed to brag in our family. Um, we are allowed to come home from a basketball game or a, a great day at work or even a tough day at work and say, you know what I did? I was the one who made that goal. I was the one who, who, who made that block when the kids were in high school. I um, helped this kid get his lines ready for the play when nobody else would help him. And, um, and we like let each of my kids or ourselves, we're all allowed to brag. Now, we keep it, you know, within reason. We're not allowed to, you know, we have kind of some little like unspoken rules. You don't go around to everybody bragging, but there's a certain level of, of, of admitting that you're good at something that's important. You should do that. Admit. And then it, sometimes I have a couple of friends who, who their kids, I had a friend the other day who, whose kids, you know, made it, that they're going to get to go and play um, college football. And they, they, they started telling me about it and they were like, well, I mean, I don't, I don't want it to sound like I'm bragging, but it was kind of cool. And I was like, girl, tell me about it. I want, you probably haven't gotten to tell very many people. Tell me, I want you, I want to know every single amazing, great thing that your kid did. Tell me how great it was. Um, because, you know, maybe one day I'll get to do that with her and brag about my kid. But I, I just think you should do that. So think about the ways you have become and been, and or even maybe want to be an Aishit Kyle, a woman of valor, a strong, courageous, powerful, strategic, militarily strong, um, uh, um, uh, powerful, whether it's physically or emotionally, sometimes it's just getting up and taking care of somebody else. List those ways, maybe list them in your head, but maybe journal them or write them somewhere, stick them on in your car, stick them on the mirror, maybe stick them in front of somebody who's being mean to you. <laughs> Look what I did. This is who I am. You are an ancient Kyle, a physically, emotionally, spiritually, militarily, mentally strong woman. And the ways that you aren't, that's okay. You will be. We will get stronger together. You are going to be okay. We're going to go into this next semester and we're going to, uh, these next several lessons, and we're going to come up with new ways and look at people who, who have also been strong and, and a whole bunch that have failed and figure out ways that um, we can be like them or be encouraged by them. And um, I'm excited for all of this that we're going to be doing. Now, Here's a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of lists of things, a few of the books that I like that I'm recommending right now. Like I said, I may or may not agree with every single one of them. I just think it'll expand your understanding of who God is and how God sees women. Um, the list of websites, Facebook, Twitter, these are over here on the left, my left, um, I guess your left too, um, that just are just some different people that I follow, um, men and women. And there is my link for um, these videos you get that in the email that i sent you but forestfire.com is just that's my company but i just went ahead and added like a little private page that initially i called apologetics because apologetics is about making a defense for what you believe and that's what we first started talking about but now we've got a whole lot of other things about talking about women and stuff and that youtube video if you just google in kate wallace and uh Bioli university talk um, she's got a really cool little about 20 minute, 15 minute little talk that she did that sort of sums up a lot of how I feel about and what God, uh, how he describes women and, and this whole ideas of, of um, complementarianism and how it holds women back and all that stuff. Does anybody have any cool questions or any thoughts? Remember you're being recorded right now, but is there anything that you uh, are uh, have any thoughts or questions about or something that um, you want us to talk about or want me to talk about um, in our study in the next 
couple of months. Anybody go ahead now. Nothing. Hey, Paula, hadn't seen you yet. <laughs> well, hope you guys enjoyed tonight. Um, and uh, I, um, I'm excited about what we're gonna do. Uh, right now, my plan is to talk next week um, about Genesis 3 and the curse, um, the curse that uh, was um, uh, put on women, and the woman and the man, Adam and Eve. Um, and uh, we kind of like tiny briefly touched on it. We did mostly Genesis 1 and 2 during the summer and I realized I really hadn't done much with Genesis 3 and it's kind of a big a big deal um, um, for us to un have a good understanding of it because like I've told you before um, people translate it improperly and translate it um, incorrectly I've been I read it wrong a lot of times and, and it's hard to get that Hebrew ancient 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 Hebrew <laughs> um, into English and so it, it, it takes a little bit more um, energy that uh, that we need to put into it Kate did you have a question um, yeah. No, go ahead. Judy. I actually do. Oh, go ahead, Kate. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, sorry. You were asking about something. Okay. I'll, I'll ask so, um, I have friends um, in the Southern Bell, what is that what they call? You know, uh, the state in the southern part, and they really believe in the traditional. You know, man should lead, woman should you know be submissive, and things like that, which is. Um, how do you explain to them when they when they use scripture like in First Corinthians fourteen when Paul talk about you know women should be quiet in the church and you know things like that? How do you how do you explain all this? Well, um, uh, one of the best things you can do is is kind of you know if they throw out a passage like that, say hey, let's look at that together, and um, and and see if they're willing to look into some of the other. Um, interpretations of that. There's like I, that very last page that I that I that I shared on the slideshow has several authors um, and um, that that um, that address those particular verses. And because it there's some very specific words that are changed from e Hebrew to English, there's context that needs to be taken into account. For instance, the Bible tells us in in the um, the New Testament like five times men greet one another with a holy kiss and yet i don't know any men who do that <laughs> because if you ask somebody why they don't do it they say well that was cultural that was the time period and then though they take a a verse that has to do with the length of women's hair or um or uh men and women in their relations and they say that that's not cultural and they take very specific verses so you have to kind of you have to do a little study, but um, on the resources page that I just mentioned, and then I'll send in the email again, I have a whole lot of little short articles and, and, and some longer books that are really good at looking at some of those specific things. And I also have actually done a lot of, already did teaching on it this summer, if you want to watch my long, you know, blah, 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 talking. But um, the articles are really good. And I think one of the best things for you to do is um, is is just to to look up some of those verses. You actually just mentioned a couple of them. You know, we all know what they are. We've all skipped them as women. <laughs> We've skipped over them. Um, and and look up what um, um, uh, N.T. Wright or Scott McKnight or Mar Marg Mousko or some of these other um, theologians have said about it and um, and say, oh, that that really isn't actually what those verses mean. We've been taking that out of context because it's very easy to pick and choose the things that we like um, in the word. Um, so um, I think it's important if they're interested in listening to you that you do help the women and the men because because it leads to abuse. It leads to abuse in your mind. It leads to it can lead to obviously physical abuse if there's a a man who thinks that he's more powerful than you and you need to be quiet <laughs> or um or a woman who will take it um there are churches who who talk about there's act john piper who wrote that book recovering biblical manhood and womanhood um he actually has said um uh, a woman should be willing to be slapped around for a night until she can get to the elders of the church the next day not call the police not <laughs> not get away from them but be willing to be slapped around um, because in part, possibly because she may deserve it. Um, he didn't say it that way, but um, that's sort of implied with it. So uh, that's the idea. Now, that's why you see right now 
the entire Southern Baptist um, Convention had huge are having huge issues right now. The um, huge mega churches, um, uh, the Me Too movement is also happening in the churches. It's called the Church Two, Church Two hashtag Church Two movement. Um, the Southern Baptist Convention is in a terrible mess right now because they have ignored. Um, for many, many, many decades, what has been happening with um, uh, pastors, leaders in the church, men um, who have been doing things to women, young ladies, um, and, and it being ignored. So um, just being shoved aside or the women blamed, and finally women have gotten the courage to speak forward. So it does cause a lot of problems. So if you, it is important for us to know that. So I would suggest that you start doing some research, <laughs> look up some of the resources that I mentioned on our page and, and just Google around and, um, and uh, be ready to help your friend to see that. Sometimes it may take you having some courage to say it, to say, listen, I'm kind of worried about you. <laughs> or it may just be, I don't, let's just talk about it. Can we talk? Let's just talk. <laughs> let's just talk about what, what the Bible says. Let's have our own little Bible study. Throw me at them. That'll scare them. Uh, Judy, did you have some, <laughs> did that help, Kate? Did that help? Yes, thank you. Sorry, I, I can answer a question for 20 minutes. One question that takes 20 minutes. Judy, did you have something you wanted to? Mine was more of a, just a comment. I, I I was reminded of a book that I read and um, Mel was talking about a movie about uh, a woman in World War II who I believe she was an American who went to fight with the French resistance and she had actually lost part of her life. And, and actually she was a huge turning point for the war to turn around this woman who and i think mel had mel can you tell me the name of that book again or, or that uh, the name of the book was a wolf the wolves at the door and then the movie she said was a woman of no importance i thought that was very interesting for the title of the movie a woman of no importance when she was like the key turning point right in the world world war ii that's crazy. the name that was the name of the of the movie the book Wow. The name uh, of the, the book, book is, is A Woman of No Importance. Wow. And the oh, movie... that was a different one then. Um, there was A Wolves at the Door was another one. Maybe it was uh, this, about the same person, but uh, that was the one I read was The Wolf at the Door. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. Okay. I will look that up. Put that in our notes. I'm sorry, Mel, what were you saying? You had something too, you said. Um, I'm trying to find the movie. I'm trying to find the, the newest um, movie. Her name is Virginia Hall. The girl, the spy is Virginia Hall. Yes, yes, she was a spy. That was very fantastic about. Well, I love anything that shows women of valor. I, you know, I'm a woman who, you know, tends to be a little out there, a little, you know, dynamic, sanguine personality. I, I seem, seem to be um, kind of real tough and I'm not always tough. Um, and there are things that I have to, you know, pump myself up to be courageous. And there's others, I, women I know, who tend to be much more, um, much shyer or even fearful. And um, we have to help each other in all these things. And um, we've been going a long time. I actually thought my lesson was gonna be short tonight. Once again, <laughs> I went I went a little long and I apologize for that. Um, you guys can um, email or text me anytime um, and uh, uh, call me, those of you who know me. And um, um, I would love to help you or encourage you or to hear your story because I want you guys to be free. I want you guys to, um, know how much God loves you and he is not judging you and there is no shame. <laughs> You're not doing it wrong. Make those lists about your, your valor, um, your courage. Um, uh, tell somebody about your courage um, and your valor and um, those things that you do fulfill each day or each week um, and um, be blessed. Um, let me pray real quick. Father, thank you for these women that are watching here and those who will watch later. And, and, and I ask for you to help all of us to know that we are women of valor. We are women who um, you have called. We can do great things. We are doing great things for you, even if we're just sitting, talking with a friend in a coffee shop or visiting with someone or helping someone um, who is sick. Um, all of those things are important. And, and um, you've given us um, um, hearts that are turned towards you. And we, I ask that you give all of these women um, more wisdom and more courage and more valor um, as they fulfill the call that you have on their lives. And pray all these things in Jesus' name. Women, go be free. I want you to have a great week. I will see you next Monday night, um, or I will see you online. Guys, bye. Be blessed. Thank you.
Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.